Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted. This is episode 887. I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm George Conger. Today is October 22nd, and there are 12 days until the bishop arrives. All right, thank you for joining us for another uh, episode of Anglican Scripted. This is our happy place. George and I get to log on to our webcams and talk to each other for about two hours a week. Uh, the first hour is fellowship and fun. The second hour we record for you, and hopefully it's fun and fellowship as well. We talk about Anglican stories and Christian news stories and some Roman Catholic stories uh, that happen every week, and uh, we're glad you enjoy that. Before we get too far into the program, this is the, the, the point that I ask you to like it. It's free advertising. There's a little button that on the, the lower left hand or right hand of your screen if you're on YouTube or Facebook. If you click that, you're telling Facebook and YouTube that this is a worthy show. And then YouTube and Facebook promote it free. They say, well, it's a worthy show. People like it. Uh, we think we can find other people who like it. And that's you helping us with free advertising. And we're not asking for money. Just that little click, click, click. Uh, go to the comment section. One of the best places uh, we get to see what you think and feel about our show and what we're talking about is in the comment section. Give us your opinions, uh, check up on what other people are commenting, comment on what other people are commenting, and it's just a wonderful thing that progresses throughout the week. Uh, we still have comments on the last show from, uh, we're going on seven days. We really appreciate that. Uh, anything else? No, that should do it for now. George, how are you doing this week? I am running around with my head cut off. There may be war in the Middle East, elections coming up, but none of that matters because the bishop is coming. Uh, we're having a, uh, our, it's the third time the bishop's hit that we've had a bishop come to mm -hmm. do confirmations and whatnot in my 10 years, 10 plus years here. We, he comes around every three or so years or so. And so I'm making sure the books balance and the uh, property's clean and the kids are scrubbed and, uh, <laughs> This will be the first time uh, Bishop Justin Holcomb will be here. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't really know what he's looking for or expects. Uh, when John Howe was bishop, uh, it was like having a uh, an admiral come to expect the ship. Uh, Clean those altar um, tables. Yep, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh -huh. And uh, Bishop Howe would sort of quiz the children. And, uh, oh, that's cool. Uh, well, I, no, it's not, because I remember in 20, 2002, when I was down in Sebastian, that was the first time I was a rector, mm -hmm. and I had a visit from Bishop Powell. He lined up the children uh, from the Sunday school, and he started asking them questions, and uh, he asked the elementary school kids, now, uh, what happened on Good Friday? And the children said, that's the day Jesus was crucified. And then he said what happens three days later and one little child said well if jesus sees his shadow there'll be six more weeks of winter um needless to say the uh, uh bishop powell uh, encouraged me to strengthen my uh, christian education curriculum so uh hopefully uh, we won't have any uh confusion of the groundhog's day and the easter bunny and jesus among the little kids well the bishop visited our church that we're going to ch uh, Christ Church Echo Key uh, on Sunday and uh, had a little Q and A after the church and we this church um, had confirmed seven new congregants that was pretty awesome no baptisms this week it is what it is uh, and it was a wonderful Q and A we uh, he talked about his time in the uh, conclave and some good Q and A about what's going on in the province and the diocese and it's very encouraging to to see what was you know i remember hanging out with q a with a tech bishop in the 90s uh andrew smith and that was not encouraging at all so it, but it's a new Kevin, time there's something some little little weird here because uh we're the bishop is going to celebrate our 30th anniversary and i've been here <laughs> a third of the length of the history of this church uh -huh. and and uh your acna congregation has been there 300 years plus three Three hundred and twenty-six years uh, the Christ Church Echo Key has been uh, a serving congregation. Let's uh, bring up this. This is the ham and oyster dinner we're going to have uh, coming up on November twenty-third. I, I invite you all to come to it, 
And that's from uh, 12 to 6. This is the 99th annual. Okay, this is not uh, something we've had for 15 years or, 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 or whatnot. So um, w with the ham and, and uh, oyster drink, you can get turnips and so many other things. Apparently, that's a thing here in Maryland. Turnips. I, I, turnips. I, I never, <laughs> never knew uh, turnips were something that you would serve at a church dinner. No. If I tried that, we'd get people's wooden cows. No, I enjoy going to a, a parish up here in Maryland that's 326 years old because the parish I attend in Tampa is two years old and, and, and going uh, a wildfire down there up to two services. I just want to give people encouragement. Uh, if, you're, if your church is uh, in a place that has hard ground, Maryland is hard ground and it, it can uh, certainly be overcome. George, we should move on to the news. Let me bring up my news story page here. Uh, we saw right after our show uh, that we recorded last week, Andrew Smith Connor, a father and British Army veteran, was convicted and found guilty for silent praying within a buffer zone outside an abortion clinic in Barmouth, England. Now, People ask me, how do you know prayer works, uh, Kevin? You, you pray before your meals. You pray at night. Uh, if you remember, you pray in the morning. How do you know it works? I know it works because the evil one and the pagans and the secularists and all those who hate Christianity oppose it, even silently, as England has done, George. Let's talk about the story a little. Well, Adam Smith Connor, mm -hmm. as you mentioned, uh, he's a retired army off uh, army veteran. He went out to a uh, an abortion clinic where er, years earlier his girlfriend at the time or wife I don't remember which had an abortion and they aborted his son. And at the time he had no problem with that. He had since become a Christian, and he went to this place and was praying silently for the soul of his aborted child. And he was arrested under the Public Spaces Protection Order. And this order prohibits certain activities, including silent prayer near abortions. And this was a big case in England, and uh, Smith Connor was defended by the Alliance Defending Freedom because he was not preaching out loud, he was not shouting, he was not shouting Allah Akbar and marching through the center of London. That's okay. Or death to the, death to the Jews, or from That's the okay. river to the sea, Palestine yeah. will be free. Mm -hmm. Instead, Smith Connor was praying without making any public gesticulation, silent prayer with a head bowed for the soul of his child and for the soul of all the children who had been lost at this abortion clinic. And he was arrested for this. And all he did was pray to God in the privacy of his own mind, yet he has been now convicted as a criminal. Mm -hmm. So the consequences of it. Now, his actual uh, sentence was uh, conditional discharge and a 9,000 pound fine. So he's not going to be in prison. 9,000 pounds. Oh, my Lord. Well, he, there's a little bit of justice that the Bournemouth Council employed a lawyers and it's costing them over 100,000 pounds. Uh, to, to prosecute this guy. So, and now the Bournemouth Council's out of money because they've spent it all attacking this fella. The, the issue here is this is criminalization of thought, not just speech, but mm -hmm. thought. Adam Smith Connor has wrong thought. And this wrong thought is a threat to the state. And the state has decided which things are wrong thought, and one of them is abortion. You can call for changing Britain to an Islamic Republic under Sharia law. You can call for the genocide of, uh, you, know, mem you know, the Jews living in England. But if you pray silently, or there was a story uh, I just came, saw the other day, last night, where one of the first men, a grand man are my age, 62, uh, was jailed for uh, holding a placard at a uh, yep. protest, uh, he was jailed for two or three years. He took his life in prison. He was so, you know, I don't know the circumstances, but here's here's a death directly tied to the government's crackdown on those who protest against government policies on immigration. George, I wonder. Yeah, let's. Uh, okay, 
Okay, that's something else. Uh, George, I wonder if uh, a Muslim had gone to this protected zone and had prayed to Muhammad about stopping abortion, if that person would have been arrested. Uh, if that person would have been arrested. And the back of my mind says no. No. First of all, praying to Muhammad won't end abortion. Uh, but I'd, I would say that uh, this person was arrested because he was white, Anglo-Saxon, Christian, uh, bowing his head near an abortion clinic. But a Islamic person could probably get their rug out and uh, pray to the East uh, five times a day in the same uh area and not be arrested i'm just putting that out there i'm not trying to be controversial but uh there's always more to this that than um than you see yeah there's a great deal of hubbub in england about a two-tiered justice system mm -hmm. where uh rapists and pedophiles and people committed of manslaughter and all these things serve less time in jail than uh than a woman who posts a, a tweet uh, angered at immigrants. You get a three-year sentence for that. Uh, you get a conditional discharge and told never to do again if you rape a child. And, the, and it's the same judges who are issuing these sentences, but it's different defendants, uh, different classes of defendants. One are immigrants or people of a different faith than the majority of the English population. And what the... I don't want to go too deep into the woods of English politics, but uh, the conservative, you know, the liberal party's all in, the social democrats are all in, and, Labor party. and the conservative, conservative uh, the Labour party's all in, and the conservative mm -hmm. party is all in on all of this stuff. And the conservatives are trying to elect a new leader, but the they don't want to speak about the issue that led to reform, the reform party sort of cleaning their clock. And I don't know why they don't have the courage of their convictions to speak out. Maybe it's just the political class in England. Well, <sighs> yeah, I, this may be the failure of uh, English nicety. Mm. You know, the, the English people are the nicest people. Um, they can insult you verbally without you really knowing until you think about it later. Hey, I was just insulted. You know, they, they speak elegantly and with uh, such poise. And I, I don't know. I, I don't get it. Uh, I don't know. Let's move on to the next story. You, try, you could spend all day trying to figure out the English. Synod on Synodality. This is a Roman Catholic story with Pope Francis. Here's called to adopt Anglican Churchology. Hmm. Anglican What's Ecclesiology. Yeah. The, uh, I feel badly for our friends who've joined the Catholic Church in the last few years from the Anglican world. Now, the Anglican ship has been sinking for a long time, but there has been a lifeboat, the ACNA, and in the case of the Episcopal Church, it has basically come to a rest on a rock. So there is water coming over the gunnels, but we're not sinking any further. Lifeboats are in the water. Yeah. But those who've jumped into the Catholic Church, that ship is going down, and it's going <laughs> down. Kevin, you had the best analogy, what you were telling me well, before the show. Well, let, let me complete the analogy. If we're going to talk about a ship, uh, the the um, Episcopal Church clearly has hit a reef and is taking in water. Uh, the Anglic Anglican Church uh, ship has run aground. Uh, the Roman Catholic Church has a captain in Pope Francis who's scuttling the ship. And th there's your analogy. So... Yeah. I don't know. Well, what's, hap what's happened is that Francis, the Synod on Synodality is meeting in Rome. And this is a, uh, a meeting called by Francis, uh, with, charged with charting the future of the church. And what's going to happen is they'll come up with these recommendations. And the committees that met will continue working to refine the recommendations, which will be given to Francis. In about six months to a year's time, Francis will come out with a larger statement of doctrine and discipline based on this work. And Francis's uh, pattern has been to have really liberal statements, which he then peels back. So he's not going all the way, but he is moving incrementally to the left. One of the committees uh, Francis has formed uh, to study 
church issues is ecclesiology. And they are recommending that National Bishops Conference be given the authority to interpret doctrine. This is the decentralization of authority. Rather than doctrine coming from on high, from Rome, and the bishops charged with implementing doctrine, the bishops would be charged with deciding doctrine. And this means that what could be a sin in Nigeria would be a blessing in Germany. So if the German bishops want to allow gay marriage or uh, women, all these different things sure, that are yeah. being pressed, uh, divorced and remarried people being received fully at communion, uh, this would be perfectly fine in Germany, but could still be immoral or unlawful in Nigeria. Now, the critics are saying, well, this is relativism, that there's not a single truth, there are many truths. And some of the proponents are saying, well, yes, that is right, because there is no one truth. There are truths. There are many ways now, to God, I, I recently heard him say, so yeah. Ke Kevin and I have been doing this for so long, we've been down this path. And it took us 25, 30 years in the Anglican world, and you're doing it in two or three years in the yeah. Catholic world. This is pure Frank Griswold stuff. Mm -hmm. Griswold was saying this 2003 with Gene Robinson that, well, it may be a truth in Nigeria that uh, same sex is the same. Yeah. relations yeah. are contrary to God's will, but they're not contrary to God's will back in New York. Mm -hmm. And he was serious about this. And that the Anglican world um, decides doctrine on a, do a provincial by province basis. We started down this road with women clergy, then we went into this with human sexuality. We broke uh, apart based upon the moves made by individual provinces and dioceses. And this commission is proposing this as well. Now, it's had a big pushback, but that pushback doesn't really matter if Francis is on board. Another little thing is that Francis has said, okay, no women deacons. That door's closed. Now, people, some women, advoc women clergy advocates are basically furious, and opponents are like, whew, that's off the table. Well, there's another commission that's been meeting, and there was a speech by a uh, nun that is on one of these commissions, and what they are saying is that to take religious women i don't mean women who are religious but the technical term for nuns None is, is, yeah. and make that an order of ministry and give a, a, so that we're not changing traditional church teaching on priests and deacons they must be men but we'll now have religious women as an order of ministry and we'll give them the authority to celebrate the sacraments so we won't have women priests, we won't have women deacons, we'll just have uh, Mother Superior being able to celebrate the Eucharist in her convent. So hmm. this is a way around John Paul II saying never because God has said no to women priests. Well, we won't make them priests, we'll make them, we'll keep them as nuns, but give them the authority of priests to bind and to loose. That which God, you know, God is bound and loosed, and you know, the the charism given to Peter, thou art Peter, and on this rock the church shall be built. And what you bind in earth will be bound in heaven, and loosed yeah. in earth, and be loosed in heaven, and all that is devolved to the clergy. That devolution will pass to nuns in the Catholic world. This, uh, well, let, let's back up. Uh, People, but the, the Roman Catholic Church was so strong 20 years ago. What happened? Well, the Roman Catholic Church, when they appoint a pope, that pope gets to appoint future cardinals. And he gets to uh, uh, appoint cardinals who he thinks will agree with him. And in a short five years now, six, seven years, uh, Pope Francis has done an amazing job of appointing cardinals that agree with him. And so this makes this job of bringing uh, sacramental orders to the, the nunnery easier because he's, he's overcome any obstacles by getting cardinals that agree with him. I've known two cardinals in my life. 
Mm-hmm. One was a teacher, a man who went on to be a cardinal, Avery Dulles, who was a Jesuit, who's okay, very yeah. traditional minded, yeah. very conservative. He was an old school Jesuit. And the other is somebody I knew when I was at Oxford named Timothy Radcliffe. He was a Dominican. Radcliffe, I did he wasn't a teacher, he was just somebody I'd go to his occasional talks and everything. So mm-hmm. I knew of him. So he doesn't know me, but Dulles knew me and everything. Radcliffe, I remember at the 2008 Lambeth Conference, he was one of the ecumenical observers, and he was all out supporting the gay agenda as a Catholic observer. Mm -hmm. And Radcliffe recently spoke. uh, Radcliffe is too old to vote at the next uh, papal conclave. I think he's over 80. But the point being, the Pope is basically rewarding uh, those members of his team with their final accolade and radcliffe is quite clear about the uh the the movement to liberalize or change or whatever you want to call it the teaching on marriage and human sexuality um and these are the two cardinals and me meanwhile meanwhile let's get back to the jesuits because those are the favorite boogeymen for uh some catholics while the synod and synodality has been going on the jesuits at their headquarters in rome have held a conference led by uh, some cardinals and bishops and Jesuit leaders um, and led by Father James Martin, who is an editor of America magazine and a very prominent commentator in the American Catholic world, where they're sharing how God is doing a new thing on human sexuality. We're getting the same language, the same theology, the same teachings that you and I have been hearing Kevin in the Episcopal Church since 2003. Yeah. And now it's the Jesuits in Rome holding conferences applauding this work and urging other Catholics to see the light as they have seen the light. Now, the next Pope is one of the cardinals likely uh, appointed by Pope Francis. Yeah. Um, I, th- I don't know what the number is, like 70% of the current active cardinals he's appointed uh-huh. um now he appoints he's appointed a number of people from the back of the beyond uh yes. the, the periphery from mongolia and places like that uh they're sort of the catholic version of dei picks you know to not just have more italians so that may balance things out but certainly amongst the europeans and the north americans that have been made cardinals they overwhelmingly are of a particular cast of mind. And here's the funny thing, it doesn't match the Catholic Church on the ground. Catholic seminarians and new clergy are, at least in the United States, overwhelmingly conservative. They're not liberal. But the leadership is liberal. And I saw that, and I'm seeing this in the Anglican world as well. You know, Jeff Walton did that story about uh, Wheaton College where these People are coming into the Anglican world based on their love of the doctrine and liturgy from all corners. And these fellows are far more conservative than uh, the bishops and the old farts like me. It's crazy. I mean, we just report the news. (laughs) I, you know, I I don't have a lot of hope for the future of the Roman Catholic Church. uh, the Roman Catholic Church is going to be in a place where it's going to have to repent as well in the Episcopal Church and the Methodist Church. And um, I don't know what a breakup of the Roman Catholic Church would look like. Uh, we, uh, certainly Italy and Rome on one side, um, the Europeans and Germans on the other side. I don't know. Yeah. Well, it would. Fo- it, I think it would, uh, not to be cynical, but it would mm-hmm. follow the patterns of the Episcopal Church in the mm-hmm. Anglican world, where we have a division between money and the masses. The money in the Catholic Church is in Germany and in the United States and some European countries. And the, but the great mass of Catholics, like the great mass of Anglicans, are in the developing world. South America, Africa, Asia. But money talks and that drives the agenda the people who can pay for the conferences, the people who can fly people elsewhere. The voice of some bishop in um, Burkina Faso is of nothing compared to the editor of America magazine in the United States. Well, did not and the it's diocese, all driven by money. Diocese of, of LA just pay out a billion dollars uh, for uh, the, the sex settlement 
Yeah. Yeah. So, but here's the thing. They got money. They have the money to pay. Yeah. It's not like some of these uh, lawsuits you hear about. Well, somebody's awarded a hundred trillion dollar judgment. Well, fine. You know, try collecting that. They have the money to pay these judgments. Mm-hmm. And the well, money is not going to stop. I do remember when this scandal broke out in the late 80s and 90s that uh, here in America, they made sure that the churches uh, were all localized, that the church owned the church so that it would uh, make sure that if you sued that church, you couldn't sue the diocese or the or the national church. So it's not quite uh, as convoluted as the Episcopal Church and the Dennis Canon, but uh, you know, we'll, we'll have to well, see what happens. We, Well, we need to work on the principle that men are evil and fallen and broken, and we can sort of count on people to do the wrong thing unless Christ is active in their life. (laughs) Well, moving on to the next story, men and women are evil, fallen, and broken. Um, I remember in the 80s, there's a Colgate uh, Colgate uh, commercial in the Crest, and these are fluoride toothpaste here in America. Eight out of nine dentists recommend Colgate toothpaste. Or eight out of nine dentists recommend that you buy well, whatever it is. You, you you had to you had to get somebody who with authority, and you had to get eight or nine of them. There was never ten. It was never nine out of ten. And well, you so, know, Kevin, more doctors prefer Lucky Strikes than any right. other brand of cigarettes. I know, the unfiltered. Not if you get the filtered, you're not getting the full flavor of the cigarette. So you uh, put in the stories here. Uh, story number three, four. Out of five Scottish Episcopal Church bishops call for Bishop Ann Dyer to resign. Now, all right, four out of five. There's an e- even number. Let's get the story on the books. What's going on there, George? Well, this story we reported last week, and we were reporting it for about a year and a half, two years. Ann Dyer, Bishop of Aberdeen in the Orkney, Orkney Islands, is has messed up her episcopacy pretty badly by being a bully. Those are the charges laid against her of bullying. So we could say alleged bully. Yeah. Mm, well, she. <laughs> oh. Okay. For legal purposes, we will say allegedly, or she has been accused. Accused of bullying. Of bullying yes. We are not witnesses, so we cannot make fact statements on that yeah, point. Yeah. And it is a- alleged that she has had a history of bullying in previous jobs, mm-hmm. college dean. I made a mistake of fact. I said that she went from being a dean to a bishop. No, uh, she was fired as a dean because of bullying. And then I said that she she landed on her feet as a bishop. There was an intervening period there where she was in the Scottish Episcopal Church in a parish. So I made that mistake. But the principle, I I was directionally (laughs) correct. She was failing upward. Uh, But uh, there was that intermediate stop. Okay, Dyer was brought up on charges and there were two independent commissions and both commissions uh one by a prominent member of the church of scotland their former moderator and the other by a human resources hr specialist uh both found her credible evidence that she had engaged in conduct that basically called for her to remove from the episcopal office yes legal of legal work began within the church of the Scottish Episcopal Church. And last week, the uh, procurator general, or I don't know what the term is in Scotland, but their prosecutor, uh, uh, King's Council, said, we're going to drop prosecution. There's credible evidence that she was engaged in misconduct and bullying, but for the be- for the greater good, for the good of the church, Scottish Episcopal Church, we're going to drop this and quietly, because we don't have any money to prosecute. Now, Dyer took this and released a public statement saying, I've been vindicated, here I come, I'm back in office, I'm happy to be on vacation in Italy right now, but as soon as my vacation's over, I'm coming back as if nothing's changed. And because, you know, innocent until proven guilty, I've not been proven guilty. Well, this prompted There are six Scottish bishops, four of the six, Dyer is one of them, and then the bishop who has been covering for her, he decided to stay neutral because he's still... Disappointed to be bullied, yes. He's he's been (laughs) caring for that diocese. Four out of five other bishops in Scotland have said, you got to go, Anne, because you just, 
are unfit for Episcopal office. Well, Ann Dyer is related. You can't respond it. You can't bully me. I'm going nowhere. I'm staying until I decide I want to retire. And because they've dropped legal proceedings, basically because they can't afford to prosecute her, they're at an impasse. Mm -hmm. You know, what's mm -hmm. going to happen? There's oh, going yeah, to, yeah. Are they going to go into an impaired communion? Are they, uh, how are they going to squeeze her out? Uh, they're not going to send her money from the national church. Who knows? Um, but it's just a horrible situation um, in the Scottish Episcopal Church. We've had some defenders in the comments of her saying that, uh, that the attack has been unfair. But I have to say I'm not persuaded by their defenses. Um, no, nor am I. I mean, this is an unintended consequence. They wanted to intentionally put in a female bishop in a very conservative diocese and and uh, Dyer fit that DEI bill perfectly. Yeah. Okay, the problem is she has a history, allegedly, of bullying uh, in her career. And they said, well, we can overlook that because our intention is to show that we can have women bishops serve in an Orthodox diocese. What could go wrong? Well, now you're stuck with her and uh, she's 67 or something like that. She's, uh, you know, not going to retire easily. Um, unless, of course, somebody tells Hillary Clinton that Ann Dyer has the goods on her. Then her life may be, yeah. Yeah, I, I think yeah. at this stage we're at a Hillary level proceedings. <laughs> that somebody needs to tell Hillary Clinton that she knows the truth about Benghazi. Yeah. Or she's hold, she has the Whitewater files. Mm -hmm. And uh, then something will happen. But, I, that, as, but remember, he, for, for, yeah, for our viewers who may not know, she was not elected bishop of this diocese. Appointed. She was appointed bishop of this diocese. Mm -hmm. The diocese was looking to elect somebody, I hate to say it because it sounds vulgar, sort of like me <gasps> in outlook, in gender, in, in stance on uh, the gay issues and other things. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I'm not Scottish, so I wouldn't have been elected. But my point is, they had a profile and the first election fell between people who sound and look like me, and neither one got a majority. And then the bishops went in and did a bait and switch and put in their own person as a DEI appointment to show the world. We've got women bishops in Scotland, Yay. and it's been a fiasco ever since. What could go wrong? Uh, it has been a fiasco, and um, it serves our purposes as it's news, and we get to tell you the news, but in reality, uh, this does not glorify Christ. This is, you know, the Scottish Episcopal Church, you know, scuttling itself, just like the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, you know, way to go, guys. Um, yeah, whatever. George, uh, let's move on to our next story. It's not a four out of five story. Justin Welby is um, responding to a, bo a bill put forward by the Parliament for assisted suicide. The parliament is likely to vote on this and they want to make assist assisted suicide legal in the UK. George, just don't, I can't even talk today. Justin Welby says, wait a minute, there's a slippery slope here. Let's talk about that. Friends, I'm sorry, so sorry. I must apologize to you in advance because I'm saying Justin Welby is absolutely right. He is. Yes. He's got the moral high ground. Mm -hmm. He is telling you the unvarnished truth. And I know I should be struck dead for saying this. I'm being silly, of course. No, but, but, but he's right. He's absolutely yeah. right. Yeah. He's absolutely right. Well, uh, what makes him right is there's always a slippery slope when you go into these type of politics. Uh, abortion was the slippery slope. Uh, certainly here in America... Um, in 2015, we had same-sex marriage. It became a horrible slippery slope um, that you know made ruin America. Um, that reality exists also with assisted suicide. At some point, and he knows this, people will feel obligated to uh, commit suicide because they don't want to be a burden to the populace. We only need to look at what's happened in places that have gone down this road, the Netherlands mm -hmm. and Canada. Mm -hmm. In Trudeau's Canada, people with disabilities, cerebral palsy, uh, m multiple sclerosis, 
when they ask for government assistance for health care, they're also offered, well, you know, you can commit suicide. They get the letter, yeah. They get the letter saying, you know, you can save the government a lot of money by committing suicide. Um, and there was a recent study where a lot of doctors in Canada were concerned because there are people coming to them who are depressed or who are overweight, uh, who suff basically are suffering from chronic depression, who choose, who thinks suicide is the answer. And the answer is certainly not suicide. And we see this in the Netherlands where children have been granted suicide, you know, assisted suicide, uh, developmentally disabled people. This is the Nazi. Uh, basically, what's happening is the government puts pressure and certain groups put pressure on people to kill themselves for a better society, a more hygienic society, to have less of these people around. It's the same thing, you know, with, like there's certain countries like Iceland, where 98% of the infants uh, with down syndrome before they're born are aborted um, because they d the state doesn't want to have that impurity that uh, responsibility to care for somebody who may not be genetically fit and this the, is the, pure the, Nazism this it, is, it evil. is but the healthcare professionals in Iceland and Greenland and those countries where they abort uh, uh, those with chromosomal uh, errors proclaim it hey we have low incidence of um, these type of people in our populace. Well, it's because you're aborting them. It, you, you, it's not something you should be bragging about. You're, you're killing and taking the life of those people who uh, were clearly created by God to live a full life. Um, and, so I, see, I feel I feel very strongly about this mm -hmm. due to my personal life experiences. Um, I go to nursing homes and. Uh, one of the nursing homes that I visit every week to hold services and classes. I haven't been for two weeks because they were affected by the storms. And I went, yes, I uh, went Sunday, two days ago, and I found that the entire first floor had been flooded. And they had, mo had to move everybody out of their rooms on the first floor. And they're putting them in uh, commons areas on the second floor, eight to ten beds in a room with a single toilet for all those people and as they do the construction rebuilding. Now, most of these people are not all there. They have various dementias and this and that. And th it is so much cheaper and easier just to sort of euthanize as if these were old dogs, these people. But for me, this, you know, just holding a, a lady's hand who has no idea what's happening, why is she not having to sleep in public, why, you know, what's this noise, what's this and that. Now, from a cost-benefit analysis, yes, it would be better if she were gone. But this is a person created in God's image and loved by God, no matter how difficult their life circumstances is, and to kill them is murder. Yeah. The I'm, least I'm of these. Preaching. I'm sorry, no, no, but no, that's what we do here. The least of these. I mean, this is you, you're holding the hand of the least of these. And well, actually, Kevin, Kevin, we're doing more than that. We're buying those sock slippers. Good. So we're, we're, right. uh, no, I mean, <laughs> uh, you, you think you think about well, what can I do for these people? Well, sock slippers, little earphone, little what are they called? Uh, headphones, yeah. Headphones earphones. and those sleep masks for the airport, so yeah. they can sleep in public, and they can walk around because all of their shoes were destroyed in the on the ground floor flooding. Oh okay, well, let, let's move on and talk about uh, former Archbishop of Canterbury, George Carey, has written an op-ed saying he supports and encourages and desires that the UK would have assisted suicide. Um, okay, former Archbishop, friend of Anglican TV, friend of Anglican Unscripted and Anglican Inc. I met him, great guy. Um, I would disagree with him on this. I think it, it is a slippery slope as is LLF and some other things that have been uh, prescribed at the level of the province of the Church of England. So, yeah, I know this is a wild show. We're bashing George Carey and we're celebrating Justin Welby. It's all over. <laughs> you know, what's going to happen next? We don't know. Yeah, I don't know. 
but you, you would agree with me that uh, George Carey, best of intentions, your intentions here, uh, as with the previous bishops in the uh, Scottish Episcopal Church, you, your intention is divine. However, unintended, co unintended consequences happen in, in big policies like this, and that is the death of the innocents. And, yeah. and I would also add, and this is a theological opinion, that there is value in human suffering. Mm -hmm. Suffering is not meaningless, it's not purposelessness. Suffering can be used to glorify God. And you can offer this suffering that those who live with pain every day, who some of them are offered suicide, you can turn that into a gift to God and make your suffering of value and a purpose in this world. Look as at I the said, that's a theological yeah. opinion, but, but I, 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 want to I, back I think that George Carey is wrong on this issue. Let me, let me back that up. The last 14 months of the life of John Paul II were suffrage. He had Parkinson's disease, his body was completely uh, uh, deteriorating, and he wanted to publicly show that he was in pain and he was um, uh, suffering because that is a valued part of our life. Yeah, you know, and you know, Pope John Paul did a great job in that, and his life in the end was a reflection of glorified and sanctified suffering. Mm -hmm. So I don't mean to be theological, and you know, either, but you know, I preach it, Kevin. No, no, no. I just you know, uh, George is right on this. That you know, there's suffering is something that can be glorify glorifying to God. Uh, in fact, if you I, I, if you if you want to impress God. You don't impress God by your prayers or your good deeds and all that type of you impress God when you're suffering for him. That's 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 when you get his attention. So Oh, no more theology. Oh boy. Let's if, move if on. You're interested, well, I just <laughs> yeah. want to say if you're interested in this issue, look on Anglican Inc. for the Bishop of Blackburn, Philip North, his uh address to his uh, synod touches on this and he says some really good things. That's a good th place to start yeah. if you really want to think about this deeply. Uh, Philip Yancey has three or four books that talk about this subject, too, if you want to look up the author Philip Yancey and read about suffering uh, for the Christian. Let's move on to our fifth story. Uh, the Episcopal Church Diocese of Central Pennsylvania and Bethlehem Conventions approve a merger, another merger of diocese within the uh, sinking uh, uh, Episcopal Church, George. Let's talk about these two stories. Yeah, earlier this year, uh, I think maybe month uh, in September, mm -hmm. uh, Eastern and Western Michigan formally merged. Uh, last few weeks, Wisconsin yeah. formally was uh, united into Milwaukee, Eau Claire, and Fond du Lac were all merged into the Diocese of Wisconsin. And this past weekend, uh, the Diocese of Central Pennsylvania, which is based in Harrisburg, and the Diocese of Bethlehem, which is Allentown, Bethlehem, Scranton, that part of Pennsylvania, where the office uh, TV show was uh, allegedly to have been set. They're going to form a new diocese that'll sort of stretch up the center of Pennsylvania and over around the Philadelphia area. So in essence, they'll just be Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, the rest of the state, and a little bit of Erie, which has been in tied to Western New York Buffalo for the past few years as well. So consolidation is the name of the game. Now the and new presiding bishop, yeah. Well, the new presiding bishop said, "You know, the funding games are over. We spent all the money. Uh, we're largely in a political disaster. Let's consolidate, merge, and and try to reform." Yeah, he's acting like he's been appointed a receiver for a bankrupt company. Uh, he's looking to cut staff, the national church. He's looking to cut uh, unnecessary programs. He's looking to focus on the mission or income generation, yeah. uh, if you put it in business terms, and get rid of all the stuff that drove the church into bankruptcy. Now, Sean Rowe is not a full-fledged card-carrying conservative, but his instincts and attitude are in the right place. He was uh, went to Virginia Seminary with several of our contemporaries and friends, and they said he was a great fellow who while climbing the ladder to success, sort of bought into the uh, liberal agenda. But his instincts are sound. Now, this may be the opportunity for him to pull the church out of, a, out of the ditch. Um, 
the communion partners, and I don't mean to be unkind, but uh, basically a rather ineffective group of conservative bishops. You, that was very kind. That was extremely kind, George. <laughs> Pretty sure we spoke differently, but go ahead. <laughs> the communion partners have put out a statement, basically, well, it basically spent a lot of words saying nothing, but then saying, well, we're hopeful that Sean Rowe will be true to his word <clears throat> and focus on uh, ending the church wars. And what did I write? Uh, put the focus on survival. The Episcopal Church could not just appoint a conservative uh, new presiding bishop. And if uh, Sean Rowe ends up eating that, that uh, messy middle guy who is going to be a good business manager, uh, I'll take that. You know, you, you've done so much damage over the last uh, 25, 28 years. Uh, you know, it's time for a change, George. Yeah, so good news. Okay, so let's move on to our next story here. Um, and that is Third Diocese for the Anglican Network. In Year Third Diocese, well, they're almost a province. Uh, the Nigerians have given the uh, Anglican Missionary Congregation to ANIE. That's going to be a good story. AMC, that's mm -hmm. the uh, acronym. Uh, our Nigerian congregations uh, across Europe. Uh, that had been under the oversight of the Church of Nigeria. And they have been released to the Anglican Network in Europe, and their leader has been consecrated a bishop. And they have been, uh, this is sort of what happened in the United States with the Nigerian dioceses and districts in the United States turned over the Anglican Church in North America. And this is positive development. There are now three dioceses. They just need one more for a fourth to become their own standalone province. Um, one bit of gossip, uh, the pictures we posted on the uh, Anglican Inc. of the celebration, uh, the presiding bishop of the Free Church of England, uh, Bishop Fenwick, Fenwick was missing. And people are saying, oh, well, he wasn't invited and all this and that because of the uh, Brett Murphy wars that are taking place there. And, uh, well, I asked the Anglican Network in Europe uh, if this was true, and they said, no, Bishop uh, Finnick and Bishop Paul Hunt were invited, but both declined to attend. Mm -hmm. So, no, there's no formal break or any snubs going on. Um, the Murphy situation, and I call it that for shorthand. <laughs> well, is, it's not just uh, Brett Murphy. Uh, there's up to six or seven uh, people who've been disaffected uh, by this bishop, and uh, however, he's the latest casualty. The uh, I don't see a short conclusion um, because the synod for the Northern Diocese of the Free Church of England is coming up, but it's basically toothless in getting rid of Bishop uh, uh, Fennec. However, the Reformed Episcopal Church's uh, missionary letter for overseas mission work has announced that Bishop Fennec is retiring. Mm -hmm. Now, whether this was making news or whether this was uh, letting Fennec know that, uh, <laughs> oh, by the way, you're retiring. Uh, so, in essence, we've got almost an end dire situation going on uh, in well, the, the Free Church of England. <laughs> or the, the Free RC... Church of the Scottish have a, have a Bishop Fennec. Uh, yeah. problem. Problem. Well, if the RIC could send a letter to Anne Dyer, we could solve a lot of problems. So, yep. all right. Like you're, or just have Donald Trump say you're fired. Uh. <laughs> all right. Last story. We have some new bishops in the ACNA. Uh, we have, uh, first of all, uh, Phil Ashey was elected a bishop of the Western Anglicans. And Jason Grote was elected the co ejutor for uh, um, Ray Sutton, the RAC's central state diocese. That's kind of cool. Yeah. Uh, not so... My me I don't know about if it's Ray Sutton's co or not, but he's a co Okay, co uh, Okay. <laughs> so, um, so friends, uh, correct us uh, and no let comments. us know. Because some, because we're getting old. Uh, we've known Phil Ashy what going on oh, twenty plus years. Yeah, I, I met him in two thousand three or two thousand two before all this uh, started happening. Yeah. 
Uh, Phil, Phil, Phil was a great fellow. He's uh, educated at Stanford, went to Loyola Law School, was a district attorney in Orange County before he entered the ministry. And he has been one of the leaders of the uh, Anglican Canon Lawyers Movement. Uh, he has uh, led the American Anglican Council from being an advocacy group to being a church growth and development group. And he's, uh, he, the Western Anglicans are going to be well served by him as their bishop. Yeah, he, His only he, thing is now he's got to move from St. Simon's Island, Georgia, all the way to California. And boy, that's going to be expensive unless he already owns a place out there. Well, I mean, he, he's helped run the AEC, which used to be the black ops of the early mm -hmm. ACN and a ACNA. And he helped transform that into a, uh, a mission to teach bishops around the world how to be a bishop and uh, also to uh, be a part of the church growth projects. And, you know, done an amazing job. I think he'll serve well as a bishop. He's been on our program uh, at least three or four times. And I like him most because even as a legalese type person, he can speak lay speak to people like me about what's legal and what's not legal. Yeah. And he also does have a pastoral side. So I think he will be a good pastor to his priests. I, I think sometimes I, we have yeah. these lawyer bishops, and I'm thinking of the fellow who used to be in uh, Jacksonville. Uh, oh, his just name went out of my head, who was a horrible bishop. What a great lawyer mm -hmm. um, for the Episcopal Church. What was his name? Bishop of, Sam Howard. That's it. Sam yeah, Howard. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and there's some some guys who have risen high in the Episcopal Church on the strength of their having been lawyers in prior lives, mm -hmm. but they didn't bring with them any pastoral skills. Now, I don't think Phil Hashi has Ashy has this problem. No, he doesn't. Uh, he used to be. Uh, I thought he was the rector. I'm, I, this is my brain. Uh, rector of St. James, North Newport Beach, if I remember correctly. Uh, I, th I think his father was rector. His father was, okay. So, and he right. served some right. of his time there as an assistant before right. serving in other parishes. Yeah, put it in the um, comments if you know his bio. So we, we appreciate that. That's just where the... J and Jason Grote, yep. Canon Jason Grote. I'm assuming he's the fa son of Royal so, Grote, Royal Grote, the former yep. presiding sure. bishop of the REC. Yeah. He was elected coadjutor of the Central States. Mm -hmm. Um which is, I, I think that's like Texas and whatnot, not the Mid-Atlantic. Uh, no. right. cool. So if it is the Texas area, then that would be Ray Sutton's co -juder. If it's not, then it's somebody else. Put uh, it in the comments. You, you, the comments are for correcting us, agreeing with us, and helping us with new stories. We appreciate that very much. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode 887 of Anglican Unscripted.